He basked in the glow of gorgeous women 14 hours a day. Beautiful. Nice. She gets to kick butt and rub shoulders with stars. Action. These guys go for joy rides in cars worth more than most people's houses. And they all make a good living in the process. I can't believe people pay me to do this. We can buy what we like. We get to live our dream. They don't punch a clock. They don't work on an assembly line. They don't have bosses. These folks don't just have jobs. They've got the best jobs ever. When's the last time you heard anyone talk about how much they love their job? Not usually the kind of thing you'll hear at happy hour, because for most people, a job is just that, a job. But what if work were more like play? Instead of living for the weekend, you'd live for Monday mornings. There are people who feel that way, like the guys who run this place, a garage filled with the kinds of cars most people can only fantasize about. Dream job? Survey says, yep. Imagine growing up a motorhead, a car nut, and ending up with a full-time job buying the sexiest cars in the world with other people's money and getting to drive them whenever you want. That's what Mike Puccinello and Zach Mosley get to do all day, every day. We drive all the greatest cars, we get to buy what we like, we get to live our dream. Mike and Zach run Classic Car Club Manhattan, which in essence is a rental car agency on steroids. Instead of paying a hundred bucks a day to drive a Ford Taurus, the club's 300 plus members pay 10 to $15,000 a year for access to this $4 million fleet. This is a 1966 Fastback Mustang, one of the greatest American classics ever. A 1955 Porsche 550 Spider made famous by James Dean, who died in one at great speed. This is another one of our favorites. It's another Porsche, I know, but you can never have too many Porsches. When we first started off selecting cars, Zach and I decided we should probably have every car we've had as a poster on our wall as a kid. That's a really good starting point. Wow. wow. That sounds good. Is that a Porsche? Yeah. Mike and Zach met through the Classic Car Club of London. They wanted a branch in New York and hired Mike to help. He ran a marketing company, still does. Zach, who was working as an architectural lighting designer at the time, caught an in-flight video about the car club on his way home from a meeting in London. I said, that is a great idea. It's got to happen in New York, and when it does, I have to be involved. So I called the guys up. And the guys introduced Zach to Mike in 2004, and Classic Car Club Manhattan, the first of its kind in the US, was born. They own their business, working there full-time plus, and are in the process of securing worldwide rights to the concept with more clubs planned for Miami and LA. Members like Christian Sullivan, an entrepreneur seen here at the club's in-house bar, love the freedom the club buys them. I feel pretty lucky and fortunate that I get to have fun like this. And I don't actually have to look after the car and I don't have to park it. The best feeling actually about driving these expensive cars is that I get to give the keys back and walk away. And it's worked out well for the car guys too, which is not to say the road has been obstacle free. The hard part was we're the first people to do this in America. And so when you try to go to an insurance company, explain that you're gonna give a group of people really high powered, expensive cars, that's a problem. They got a policy which runs $200,000 a year. Rent for this garage, which houses 50 plus cars, costs $26,000 a month and they keep another garage and fleet uptown. Other realities of running the club include speeding tickets, which members have to cover themselves and the occasional accident. The worst phone call we ever get was when our Ferrari was crashed and went on fire and burnt to the ground. And it was, at the time, the most expensive car we had ever bought. We'd only had it on the road for about two weeks, so everyone was chomping at the bit to drive that car and it was totally gone. You know, nothing left of it. Crashed in spectacular fashion. The driver was okay. His membership in the club, not so much. He was thrown out. Despite the occasional mishap, Mike and Zach are happier now than they were in their previous careers. What's not to like about a job that puts them in the cars they've loved since they were kids? For Mike, it all started on a family road trip when they happened to make a pit stop in a town hosting a rare car show. 
So my mom had me in some red pants and a red and white striped shirt, so I looked like a maniac. And I was standing in front of a 1972 Daytona Ferrari convertible. And that was it for me. I have a photographic memory of my very first day I became a car guy. My dad was a greaser in the 60s. Like he and his buddies all had fast cars and drag raced each other. Like literally, you know, until one of them died in the drag race and then they sold all their fast cars and bought station wagons for the families they were starting. The cars change constantly, and Mike and Zach don't just go after the makes and models you might expect. In fact, you might be surprised to learn their latest fixation is, of all things, a 1969 Ford Bronco. So, on a sweltering Tuesday afternoon, the classic car guys head out in their $200,000 Lamborghini Gallardo to look at the $18,000 Bronco, being sold by a private owner in New Jersey. Sometimes it's not the dollar value, but the coolness factor. Can we uh, take it for a spin? You sure. want to come or? Yeah, whatever you guys want to do. We're interested, but I think the money for us is probably more around 16 grand. Right. Right, my bottom line is a little bit higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> I've already turned down two offers of 17.5. Both sides agree to mull things over and talk again. Thanks for the time. Yeah, no problem. It. I'll right. definitely come out and see you guys out there either way. Bar's free, remember. The classic car club does have a thriving social scene populated by a glamorous clientele. While Mike and Zach may not be getting quite as rich as their members, they are making a living. It's a good life for the car club guys, but that doesn't mean they always get what they want. For example, the Bronco didn't happen. But check out their consolation prize, a Ferrari 458 Italia, hot off the assembly line. You know, the Bronco, there'll be another one to buy. We've already had two, but to be the first on the block with a 458 just came out right out of the factory. That's a really special thing. That's a privilege. As if car shopping weren't enough fun, Mike and Zach are constantly thinking up exciting adventures for their members. Skeet shooting, road rallies, and today they're at New Jersey Motor Sports Park outside Atlantic City with club members Richard Thorne and Arun Master, who it should be noted are playing hooky from their jobs today. But for the owners of Classic Car Club, this is their job. If you love cars in varying degrees, or if you're really passionate about them, can it get any better than this? I can marry that class. I might yeah, propose later like today. Good day at work? Yeah. Another good day at work. Not bad. I'm looking forward to work on Monday. Coming up, most people would get fired for fighting on the job. She makes a living of it. I don't think I could handle a desk job at this point. <laughs> when Best Jobs Ever returns. For a woman who's all about physical fitness, extreme hobbies, and pushing herself to the limit, could there be a better job than this? In the middle of a day when I'm just sweating and beating up guys, it's like, I can't believe people pay me to do this. Some people punch clocks. 40-year-old Elisa Hensley punches people as a professional stunt woman. As one of about 500 females in this field in the US, she's had to master a laundry list of physical feats that makes you wonder, is there anything this woman can't do? I do a lot of martial arts. I ride motorcycles. I also do horse work, bull whip, fencing, firearms, rock climbing and rappelling, swimming, as well as hit the ground hard. She's doubled for big name actresses like Cameron Diaz, Nicole Kidman, and Charlize Theron, to name a few. Their paychecks are far fatter than hers, and they're famous. You won't see the name Elisa Hensley in lights, but that's exactly how she likes it. You get to be a part of Hollywood, be in front of the camera and do really cool kind of heightened moments of life. And then I can go to the grocery store on the way home and not have people ask me for my autograph because nobody knows who I am. Thursday, 7 p.m. Elisa is on her way to a rooftop set in downtown Los Angeles for an all night shoot. For the past five years, she's been the stunt double for Yvonne Strahovski, female lead of the NBC series Chuck. 
Yvonne plays Sarah Walker, a tough-as-nails CIA agent. She's supposed to be trained in all different aspects of killing people and just basically being a badass. From the moment Elisa arrives on set, the pressure is on. There's a $100,000 production budget on the line. A 60-person crew watching her every move. On top of that, Elisa knows next to nothing about the fight sequence she'll be filming tonight. And yet she has to have the whole thing mastered in a matter of hours because the shoot has to wrap up before dawn. Boom, stop it and bam, smack like that. Does that make sense? Not yet. <laughs> I mean, who gets to do this? Who gets to come up here at three in the morning and win a fight, you know? It's amazing. I don't think I could handle a desk job at this point. <laughs> From the start, it was clear Elisa wasn't going to end up working in a cubicle. A tomboy growing up near San Diego, she excelled in all sports, but just couldn't commit to any one. When it got easy, it wasn't fun anymore. I'd get bored with it and I'd move on to something else, and my mom did not like that at all. She's like, you'll be really successful if you just focus on one thing, and I just couldn't. I'm a big chicken. I don't know what happened to her. I don't know where she came from exactly. In college, Elisa majored in English literature. As much as she loved sports, she kept it on the sidelines, working part-time as a personal trainer and later as a horseback riding guide. When a friend from the stable told her about an audition for a TV show heavy on stunts, Elisa jumped at the opportunity. I never really knew where I was going. I just knew that I really loved to do all these highly physical things. So when I saw all that stunt work involved, it just it clicked in and it made sense what I wanted to do with my life. It wasn't a paying gig, but it was a foot in the door and a chance to start networking. Eventually, Elisa landed in front of Joni Avery, stunt coordinator for the old Pamela Anderson TV series, VIP. She hired Elisa, and it was love at first fight. One recommendation led to another, and Elisa's career took off. She learned that full-time jobs with benefits don't exist in the stunt industry, making her painfully aware that her next gig could always be her last. It's either you're hot or you're not. You'll have a year or two where you do a whole lot of work and you really have to save your money and you have to invest it wisely because you know there's gonna be a possibility of not working for three to six months and you have to be able to manage that. And this newly single mom has managed well, juggling a busy career with raising two very active children of everything on her plate, motherhood may be the toughest stunt of all. This is my stunt work going down. <laughs> Yay! Uh, 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 again! <laughs> Elisa loves her work, but sometimes this stunt double feels she's leading a double life of her own. Sometimes I feel like a secret agent. It's like, I'll see them during the day. And it's like, you go to school and you change diapers and you put them to bed. And then, you know, when night falls, you go rappel down an elevator shaft. You go do some really crazy thing that nobody else gets to do. And it feels like it's secret because like everybody else is asleep and I'm up all night like doing this cool stuff. In the hours since Elisa arrived on that rooftop set in downtown LA, she not only perfected her fight choreography, but she also taught it to the actresses, who have to do their own versions for the cameras. Tonight's fight scene will pit guest star Carrie Ann Moss of Matrix fame against Chuck's lead actress, Yvonne Strahovski. Finally, in the wee hours of the morning, it's Elisa's turn to jump in. In action. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Downtown LA, 3 a.m. Lights, camera, and a lot of action. <laughs> it's all in a day's work for a stunt woman. Great job. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Yeah. Aspirin. Elisa Hensley knows Hollywood isn't very forgiving when it comes to age, but as long as she can still bang out that one-two punch, she has every intention of being part of the scene. There's always a call for all ages of stunt people. You can do stunts well into your 60s and 70s, I think. At least I will. Next on Best Jobs Ever, professional surfer? Not quite, but surfing is a required skill for this California dude's best job. Da -da 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 -da. Stay with us.
What if your job description included mandatory surfing with your office mates? Seems too good to be true, but that's exactly the job Ryan Harris has created for himself. The only suit this businessman wears is a wetsuit. <laughs> if I catch a bunch of good waves, that's my caffeine, that's my energy for the day. Ryan and his company Eco Boardworks handcraft custom surfboards at this 3,000 square foot warehouse in Hawthorne, the hometown of the Beach Boys. It doesn't get more Southern California than that. He loves his job so much, the long work days don't phase him. A lot of the times we're here at 12 hours plus, but I love it. I literally will go to bed dreaming about some of the stuff that we've come up with down here, and the next day I'm just even more fired up, whether I got three hours of sleep or five. To generate buzz on their products, surfboard companies send team riders, ambassadors of sorts, out into the water to ride their boards. Today, Ryan is meeting up with one of his riders, Adam Taylor. Hello, Ryan. How you doing, Ryan? To co-design a new signature surfboard. Ryan wants to pin the design down quickly because the sooner the board is in the water, the sooner he gets buzz on his brand, E-Tech. It's Wednesday, and he set a deadline of Friday, two days, and the clock is ticking. I recommend that type of a deck for anybody that's doing errors and stuff anyway. Technology will help Ryan map out a basic design, but it's old-fashioned hand carving that will transform this foam blank from slab to surf ready. It's time to mow some foam. It's the kind of creative freedom Ryan always wanted, but getting to this point involved more than a few wipeouts. Born and raised in Oregon, Ryan majored in art and landed what he thought was his dream job straight out of college, working as a shoe designer for Nike near Portland. It was a really good job in my head at the time, but I didn't have very much creative freedom and it was very, very stressful. He was also sick of the weather in his hometown, so he headed south to Los Angeles. Within minutes, it seemed, Ryan was hooked on surfing. And being the creative type, he got the idea in his head to make his own board. It took about two days. <laughs> And it was terrible, but I did it. I made my own board. And I went out and surfed it, and I was like, wow, it actually works. Ryan's friends started asking him to make them surfboards. He happily obliged, but still he only saw shaping as a side job, because now he was chasing a new dream, acting. He went to auditions by day and bartended by night. A lot of people have this notion that they can move to LA, move to Hollywood and become a famous actor. I was, you know, acting, acting, acting. And then I thought I was gonna be this famous flair bartender a la Tom Cruise and Cocktail. But all the while, Ryan couldn't get surfing or surfboard shaping out of his mind. Got to a point where I would go to auditions and be bummed because I didn't think I was gonna get the gig and I was like, Dude, I'm missing waves right now. I can't surf, I can't shape, this sucks. Ryan's girlfriend, Regina Parton, encouraged him to pursue his passion full time. He joined forces with two other shapers, Todd Patterson and Chano Alvarez. They secured loans from investors and opened the doors of Eco Boardworks in May 2011, and it's already turning a small profit. What makes the company a pioneer in the surfing industry is that it produces boards for individuals and larger surfboard brands using eco-friendly materials. Natural ingredients for a natural sport became Ryan's MO. It does mean the boards come at a premium. One of Ryan's short boards goes for about $600, a third more than a board made with more traditional materials. But his clients think it's well worth it. Oh, let's put them next to each other and see what you think. But the black, it'll make it pop. Remember Ryan's team writer, Adam Taylor? It's time to add resin to his new custom board. After that, Ryan applies eco-friendly bamboo to make the board stronger and more flexible. Translation, better for doing tricks. Finally, the fledgling surfboard gets vacuum bagged and goes into the hot box, which makes it lighter and speeds up the drying process. Six o'clock the next morning. Adam's board is ready, right on schedule. And donezo. Voila. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. 
Take some pictures and get this thing out of here. Let's go. A few uploads to Facebook, and then it's off to the beach to be hand delivered. It looks really good, man. It came out really well. Yeah. I think it's gonna. We cooked it, so you can shred and boost airs on it and it won't fall apart. Okay, let's so. let's go. Two days. Don't tell anybody. After the fins are installed, Adam's new signature surfboard, which he's named the Mullet, is ocean ready. I'm not satisfied until they say, dude, this is the best board ever. I want to make sure that the customer is satisfied every single time. The verdict? I think it's perfect. Cool. Good. Stuff. Good to hear. Nice. Teamwork. <laughs> and the mullet? So the mullet, the, the mullet worked well. Yeah. It, cool. Sure did. All right. Ryan Harris doesn't want to make anyone jealous, but he's the first to admit he's living the dream, engaging in his favorite sport on a daily basis, living in, usually, sunny Southern California, being his own boss, and using his hands to create something he loves. I get dirty like a five-year-old every single day, covered in dust, covered in resin, and then get to clean up and go home and then do it all over again. I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Three, two, one. When we come back, making serious art with Legos, and you won't believe what he gave up to do it. The worst day as an artist is still better than the best day as a lawyer. When Best Jobs Ever continues. Welcome back to Best Jobs Ever. Imagine you've got a lucrative career with benefits and a bright future and you decide to leave it all behind to play with a toy you loved as a child and get paid for it. Would you look back? This guy didn't. Through the window of his New York City art studio, Nathan Suweya can still see the building that houses his former employer. The view offers a daily reminder of the life he left behind when he quit back in 2004. My boss was confused when I told him I was leaving the law firm. You know, I remember walking into his office, 42nd floor, MetLife building, and just telling him, I'm going to go start a new career playing with Lego, and I'm leaving the practice. I, I don't know if he believed me at first. I think he thought I was joking around. It's not the normal path for any attorney. I was on the path, you know, towards, uh, hopefully, partnership at the time. And so to say, ah, I'm going to get off this pathway and, and go be an artist is a big change. And so I, I don't know if my boss understood exactly why I was doing it or what I was doing. Trading law for the Legos he loved as a child didn't mean putting together a race car or Star Wars Jedi kit. No, Nathan was thinking big and he was thinking fine art, work inspired from deep within his own psyche. This is a piece called Gray. I mean, this is me emerging from where I was. It was in the corporate world, and I tried to find myself as an artist. It's me coming out of the box, right? That piece took about four weeks and 50,000 Lego bricks to build, which may sound arduous, but it beats sitting at a desk, poring over the fine print on legal contracts. The change couldn't have been more radical. Superficially, the artist got to stop wearing a suit. Physically, he didn't have to show up in an office anymore. Philosophically, he was free. But financially, he was nervous. A lot of change. Going from a very secure corporate world, health insurance, paycheck, to a very different lifestyle where you just don't know if you're going to make rent the next month. Luckily, Nathan had saved money from his law days. So while things might have been a little tighter than he liked, he never actually fell behind on the rent. He began posting his work online, and the Lego company took notice, tapping him to be one of only four Lego certified professionals in the world. There are now 11. It's a mutually beneficial deal. He showcases Lego's product, which moves bricks. And in return, he gets to buy bricks in bulk. If he needs 10,000 red 2x3s in a hurry, Lego ships them right to his door. Success didn't come easy. Galleries didn't take Nathan's work seriously at first, which hurt. But within a few short years, the sculptures began to garner attention and acclaim. These are the lions 
His latest project, a commission from the New York Public Library to build half-scale Lego replicas of its famous marble lions named Patience and Fortitude. On the open market, this pair of sculptures could bring in $30,000, but Nathan chose not to charge the library for his work, and it was a lot of work. Everything's glued together, so it should be fine. The lions are to be unveiled at the library on its 100th anniversary in 24 hours. So today is moving day, which means one thing for Nathan Sawaya, stress. Yep, even the best jobs have some of that. They're hollow. You might want to grip it there. This is the most interesting thing that we are going to move, and it's scaring me half to death. With nothing but tight corners, Getting these kings of the jungle out into the concrete jungle proves to be a challenge. Nice, very nice. Hey, watch the tail. One down, one to go. Getting the lions onto the truck is a big relief, but other challenges await, not the least of which is navigating through New York City traffic. Nathan rides behind his creations, excited for their imminent New York City debut, when suddenly there's a wrinkle in his plans. We have a major problem. They've decided we can't put the lions on pedestals. They want to put them on the ground, which is ridiculous. They'll just get kicked, and that's stupid. I've never had this happen before. Once again, Nathan's Lego artwork. Ah, it's just Lego, leave it on the ground. I don't know. I gotta go figure this out. Negotiations with the library go on behind closed doors. Our cameras are not invited inside. Within half an hour, it's agreed. The lions can go on tables, and Nathan is a lot calmer. Once we get them up on tables, it's gonna look awesome. All right, All right? so good. we're good. Once again, Nathan overreacts emotionally, but that's the artist in me. That's how it is. The next morning, Nathan and his Lego interpretations of patience and fortitude are ready for their close-ups. Took me three and a half weeks to create them, and they used 60,000 Lego bricks. And without further ado, I think it's time to unveil them. Three, two, one. It's a gratifying outcome for all parties. The library gets its lions. Nathan Sawaya and his work get respect, something that has taken him years to earn. The small crowd, which includes Nathan's former law colleague, Darwin Connor. Thanks for coming by. Nice work. Gets to witness one of those special New York moments. We all kind of made fun of him at first. It only goes to show that if you really love something and you dedicate your life to it, you become the best at it, it's rewarding. I'm happy what I'm doing. The worst day as an artist is still better than the best day as a lawyer. Dedicated! Motivated! Motivated! Dedicated! Coming up, she's building leaders one note at a time. It's not about the money. It's about the quality time someone spends with them. Her inspiring story, when Best Jobs Ever returns. It's a warm late summer night in Detroit, Michigan. A high school football team is on the field for its season opener. Hardly seems the setting to find someone with an awesome job, but turn your attention away from the game itself and you'll find a woman who will tell you hands down she hit the best job jackpot. I'm the band director. Band it? director? Yes. Probably while I doodle all day. That's right. My name is Victoria Miller. I'm director of bands at Martin Luther King. It's just wonderful working with young people and building them into beautiful, successful people. Come up here, trombones. Be careful. Trombones, baritones, right there. Okay. Ms. Miller, as students know her, is a longtime teacher in the Detroit public school system. She's best known for her legendary marching band and her dogged pursuit of excellence on and off the field. One of the songs her band will play tonight to rally the crowd is Get Ready by Detroit native Smokey Robinson. 
an appropriate choice because for the past four decades, Ms. Miller has been helping young musicians get ready for life. They've been rehearsing for weeks to get it just right. You have to be fantastic this year, great. The people that graduated, they think you're gonna be horrible. I know better. I know you're gonna be great. You have to believe it and you gotta show them. Deep down inside, you gotta give it everything you got with discipline and everything to show them, okay? The job isn't glamorous, it's not lucrative, and Ms. Miller certainly isn't the first person to do this sort of work. What makes her job so unique is that she's parlayed it into something much richer. Dedicated! Motivated! Motivated! Dedicated! Love the band! Love the band! Love the band! Love the band! It's not about the money. It's about the quality time someone spends with them. And that's what's important. And that's what they get from our band program. It's like a home to them. For many of her students, dedication to the band means more time in rehearsal and less time on Detroit streets, where the violent crime rate is about five times the national average. Times are so hard, and children need a place to be. They need things to do to keep them out of trouble. And so I'm there for them. And they need to know there's somebody they can count on. If the marching band were a company, Victoria Miller would be CEO. But this executive's bottom line has nothing to do with money and everything to do with futures, bright futures. When do you leave for college? Uh, today. Today? What time? Uh, Tell everybody which, what school you're going to. Norfolk State University. I got a scholarship on the instrument. I've only been playing a whole year. The Detroit native always knew she wanted to help young people. The plan was to play high school basketball and study for a career as a gym teacher. But then, young Victoria learned she had a heart murmur and couldn't play sports. She was devastated. But a talented musician, she knew she could fall back on her plan B, music education. She had trouble getting hired at first. She says one principal wrote her off as too shy and too small in stature to handle the students. There were problems here. He said some kids threw instruments across the room and they tried to hit the teacher. I said, nobody, nobody's going to hit me. He said, I have been working with young people a long time. I had to sell myself. And that's what I teach my students to do. You have to stand up and talk and let people know who you are and what you can do. She had a contract within a month and has been standing up for herself ever since. I'm going to tell you again how this other part goes. Whether you like it or not, whether you think I'm right or not, this is the way we're going to do it. With every graduation, this boss loses seasoned talent, which means she has to recruit new students every year. Musical know-how is nice, but not necessary. Ms. Miller says she can teach anyone to play an instrument. She's more interested in building leaders. I got a piccolo player that can play it, and the rest of you gonna learn it. That's good. I don't believe leaders are born. I believe you can build leaders. You can teach children the leadership skills so they learn how to work with others. That's important. You can come in blind and come out seeing like you never were. Like, Ms. Miller is that good. It's gratifying for Ms. Miller to see her students succeed, but the job has its hardships too. Kids act up, sometimes they don't show up. And then there's the money. With virtually no budget, the band does its own fundraising, and the tough circumstances only seem to be growing tougher. Music teachers' heads are always on the chopping block. But Ms. Miller marches on against the odds her personal mission to keep the band alive, literally saving lives. David Robinson, class of 1997, was with the band and not out with his buddies the night his best friend was killed. I was supposed to be there with him, that was the plan, but I was so dedicated to be with the marching band and do everything that the marching band did with Miss Miller. 
And when I came back home, I found that, you know, I, I was looking for my friend and his mother was crying and telling me that he was murdered. Robinson will forever credit his beloved band teacher for saving his life. The best teacher I ever had, period. We're gonna play, get ready. One, two, one, two, ready, and. When the band finally plays Get Ready under the Friday night lights, they may not hit every note, but at least they're on the same page. It's that kind of progress that keeps the head of this company coming back to her best job year after year, decade after decade. I'm proud that they've learned. Some of them didn't know how to play scales, never memorized songs, but they've come a long way. And it's only going to get better. The more we perform, the better they're going to be. Next, on Best Jobs Ever. Beautiful, gorgeous. His workday consists of hanging out with supermodels in lingerie, but it's not what you think. The last thing I'd like to be is a cliche. Now that's a best job. Don't go away. Beautiful, and just smiling is beautiful, gorgeous. Beautiful, good feeling, I'm just gonna check the light. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, Victoria's Secret photographer, best job ever. That was obvious. Anyone can point and shoot these days, and really, how hard is it to make these ladies look good? Can I get an 85 lens, please? Russell James agrees he's got an incredible job, but if you can believe him, he says there's a lot more to it than you might think. I mean, if it looks effortless, if it looks like I'm not doing much, then I feel like I'm really doing my job. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. A little bit that way, hon. Gorgeous. Pier 59 Studios in New York City. Very nice. Day three of an eight-day photo shoot for the Victoria's Secret holiday campaign, projected to earn the company hundreds of millions in sales. For weeks, Russell has been on conference calls with the company's marketing people, planning outfits, sets, themes, and there's a lot at stake. $20,000 a day to rent the studio space, 25 people on the payroll, including two supermodels, Adriana Lima and Candace Swanenpole. Beautiful. Okay, reset. And then there's Russell, easygoing, free-spirited Russell. In the end, this marketing campaign is all about the picture, so it's on his shoulders and his bare feet to deliver. I probably feel more pressure taking photographs for holiday campaigns than at any other time because I know that everyone from the chairman down have a lot riding on it. Russell James has been shooting for Victoria's Secret since 1997. His work appears in the company's thousand plus stores and in the 400 million direct mail catalogs it sends out every year. The typical path to this job might have been art school and a resume filled with high-end photography jobs. But that's not at all how Russell James ended up where he did. The right pathway, which I did not take, and at that time was an option to me, is education. I had a great difficulty keeping concentration, which nowadays would be diagnosed. But at that time in Australia, there was a lot of knowledge about that particular subject. Due to his focus issues, Russell says his education was cut short at an early age. My headmaster called me in at age 14 after I'd been somewhat disruptive and unable to concentrate in school and said, Russell, never darken my doorstep with your shadow again. You know, my dad was a great, amazing father. He said, OK, get a job. So I found a job making trash cans. And uh, that's what I did for some time. I went from making trash cans into the next logical step, which was training dogs, because I had a dog and I really enjoyed training it. And then I had another bright idea. I wonder if I went to a place where you could actually work with dogs for a living, that would be great. So I joined the West Australian Police Force, but there was this one small catch that I hadn't researched, wasn't big on research, is there was no dog squad in the police force. Canine unit or not, Russell spent five years in law enforcement. But then he got restless. He traveled and modeled, ending up in Sweden, where he bought a bankrupt modeling agency in 1989. That's when he caught the photography bug. He started taking pictures of anyone who would stand still long enough. After selling the agency in 1992, he took a slew of odd jobs to support himself. The one thing that was in my mind the whole time is I just don't want to end up back in the factory. I just don't want to end up back on the assembly line. I was terrified of that. Russell began showing his portfolio to agents and there was plenty of rejection. But finally, a lucky break. 
He shot this photo of Tyra Banks, which landed on the cover of Sports Illustrated's 1997 swimsuit issue. That caught the attention of Ed Razik, creative director of Victoria's Secret. He immediately sensed the chemistry between the models he hires for his ad campaigns and Russell. He's a handsome guy and he's a charming guy and he's got that great Australian accent. And so he's got all of that going for him, right? So it's easy enough for him to have that kind of connection. It's another thing to get it to come through the lens so that the girl is actually connecting with you on the other side. And Russell's got a unique ability to do that. Every time that I look at my email to check when I have to work and I see Russell James' name, I'm like, yes, you know, it's such a joy. It's very hard for men to make the girl feel sexy and beautiful without being weird. And he has the perfect combination of that. I feel like just safe with Russell. Reminds me of my sister's beautiful, gorgeous there. It's not about, oh my gosh, you're so sexy. That's, that's a no-brainer. They already are. They live with that every single day. I'm more interested in how their latest health kick is going or what trip they're going on or what holiday is coming up. And that's the kind of dialogue that we have. So I think the safety net is really important. It might be hard for some to believe that Russell doesn't cross the line between personal and professional, but he says it never happens. He has a long-term partner who is not only the mother of his children, she's also the creative director of his company, Studio Russell James Inc. Neither she nor anyone else in the family is phased by Russell's line of work. From my partner to my kids, they understand these people in this industry, they're my friends and a lot of them I consider family. I've become so close to them. The last thing I'd like to be is a cliche. Beautiful, beautiful, and Good. Gorgeous, sweetie. I'm gonna focus. Good. By 6 p.m., there are only two outfits left to shoot. Yes, Russell makes it look easy, and no, he didn't raise his voice once all day. But don't think that means he isn't working hard or feeling pressure. Even after reaching the pinnacle of his profession, Russell James sweats the dirty details right down to the bottoms of his feet. If my mother sees these, I'm in trouble, so um, I promise I'm gonna wash. I literally wake up every day and I, I don't slowly get up. I sort of sit bolt upright in bed and say, I'll never work again, I'm done, it's over. There's an overriding insecurity that comes with that pressure and it's, you're only as good as your last photograph. That's the truth of the fashion business. I think the moment you think I've made it, you're probably done. Russell James uses his success in commercial photography to finance a philanthropic endeavor he founded called Nomad Two Worlds. The mission is to preserve endangered cultures and it starts right in his own backyard with native Australians considered by many to be victims of genocide. If he weren't a Victoria's Secret photographer, Russell says he'd like to be an airline pilot or a roadie for a rock band. But in the end, he suspects he'd probably just circle back to what he's already doing. I'll bet a lot of us would. Thanks for joining us for Best Jobs Ever. We'll see you next time.